What is economic history? Economic history is, very simply, studying economic issues from a historical perspective. If you think of any economic phenomenon, like trade or financial markets, you can probably find an equivalent in the past and in many different countries. Some economic historians like to ask big questions, like why are some countries rich and some poor, or why some countries are colonies and others colonizers. Others may be interested about how inventions like the farm plow may affect gender roles and have persistent effects over time. One of the most useful things about economic history is that we can use it to understand our economic present. By now, all of you are pretty familiar with COVID-19, AKA the coronavirus. It's a nasty disease and extremely contagious. So it's no surprise that many people are working hard to figure out how to stop it, preferably sooner rather than later. But besides the health impact, there are also economic consequences, job losses, increased public spending, even disrupted schooling. So what does this have to do with economic history? Most people would like to know when things will go back to normal, but because this is a new disease, we don't really know how long it will take. Here is where economic history can help. Maybe some of you have heard comparisons about the current pandemic with earlier ones, like SARS or the Spanish flu. What's great about economic history is that by studying these past pandemics, you have years, decades, or even centuries of data to understand the effects, something that you can't do right now looking at the coronavirus. Are they the same diseases? No, but they don't have to be to share the same patterns and to help inform policymakers. For example, we know that social distancing works because it did over a hundred years ago during the 1918 flu pandemic. Economic historians use analytical tools from economics with historical data to show whether some of these patterns from the past may occur in the present or future, and even how long they may last. We can also uncover relationships that weren't obvious before to avoid making the same mistakes now. Take for instance, the relationship between transportation and disease. We know how easy it is for people to spread infections. You can just hop on a tram and be out of Melbourne within an hour. That's why the current lockdown prohibits us from leaving our homes. But imagine living in the 19th century before scientists understood germ theory and the existence of viruses. How do you stop something invisible before it's too late? This was the question I asked in my research about trains and mortality in 19th century Japan. When Japan first began building its railway network, everyone thought it was a great idea. You can make and send things across the country much faster, even export to the world and become an industrial economy. What the government didn't realize was that while integrating different regions would be good for the economy, it also meant a new way for people to move around and with them infectious diseases. As you could guess, areas that had rail access were also those that had higher mortality rates. And this was true until the entire country was connected by trains. But how do we know it was because of trains and not something else? Like dangerous work conditions or traffic accidents that went along with the increase in transport. The trick I used was to separate out all the different ways people died and to categorize them by infectiousness. If the hypothesis is that trains carried people and people to carry diseases, then deaths from heart failure or cancer shouldn't rise by the same amount as deaths from pneumonia or tuberculosis once an area got trains. Basically, I was testing whether trains were the vector of transmission by comparing infectious versus non-infectious mortality rates. I found that it was indeed the case, that areas with railways not only had more deaths compared to before trains were introduced, but that deaths from infectious diseases were much higher than others. What was even more interesting was that rural areas were hit the hardest, which is strange if you think that cities had the most congestion and higher population densities. However, cities were also the places with better infrastructure, government monitoring, health services, and existing populations already immune to diseases. So that was an unintentional trade-off the government made. Faster economic growth through investment in trains, but also higher mortality rates from infectious diseases. 
It's something that we can think about when we consider migrant workers in developing countries today. How they, like the Japanese, could carry contagion back to their villages on the very same trains that carry export goods. It's something to think about when governments rush to reopen their economies or borders and don't consider some of the short and long run consequences. All of these are interesting economic history questions, and they connect our past with our present. What's more, there's basically no limit to a topic, which country, or when in history you can study, as long as you have the data or find new ways to gather them. What's also true is that economic history is being made right now with the coronavirus. And hopefully someday we can study it the same way. Thanks for watching.